In February 2014, Copenhagen Zoo decided it could no longer accommodate registry number 44345, Marius. His genes were too similar to those of other male giraffes already in the breeding program. The young animal was healthy, but he was put down. Despite the protests that came from around the world. Shot dead. Marius. People love Killer. giraffes. Murderer. German zoos also have what they call surplus animals. Some are called, and it's likely that will happen more often. This is the future we're looking at. You just have to accept that in nature, life and death go hand in hand. How will this affect the public image of zoos? These lions in Wuppertal are fed six times a week. Today, they'll be served goats from the petting zoo. Breeding director Zilja Herberg will be attending the goat slaughter. I decide which animals get to live, so it's only right that I sometimes do the job too, even if it's not pleasant. Wuppertal put the African pygmy goats on their list of animals to transfer to other zoos, but no other zoo needs them. At almost four months old, the young males have to be separated from the herd. Otherwise, they might soon try to mate with their mothers. We were given permission to film something that most zoos are reluctant to show. Animals not just being born in captivity, but sometimes also being killed, even though they're in good health. The zoo also has predator animals, of course. If we don't use these animals to feed them, we'd have to order sides of beef from somewhere, and it's unlikely that those cows were treated humanely. So this is the way to go. Veterinarian Saskia Dreyer will be killing the goats in the familiar surroundings of their own pen. The bolt gun is a device also used to stun cows and sheep before they're slaughtered for human consumption. I got the angle. Okay. The gun is used to stun the animal by firing a metal bolt into its brain. The staff then cuts its throat, and the kid bleeds to death. Wuppertal Zoo typically calls young goats from the petting zoo once or twice a year. You're glad once it's over, because of course it's not something we enjoy. Deciding which animals to slaughter is a moral dilemma. Zoo visitors tend to prefer that the animals fed to others are ones that also end up on our plates. But a zebra? Zilja Herbeck and zoo director Anne Lavrens want the public to question their gut feeling. She's not there, typical. She's not in the big enclosure. So she's got to be somewhere else, maybe in the stable on her own. She's been ejected from the herd. In recent weeks, the male zebra has been bullying a female called Charlotte. If we take a look from the side, yes, there she is. The male zebra has been kicking and biting the female. Charlotte has to be moved. If Silja Herbeck can't find her a new home, the zebra might also end up as lion feed. So far, this hasn't become a common practice in other German zoos. Some of my colleagues are afraid of scaring off visitors. There's this idea of zoos as a kind of cuddly, perfect little world like in a Disney movie where everyone's happy. A world where there are only births, but there's no death. But we need to talk about reality instead of creating this idealized and unrealistic world for people just so they feel happy. The director would like to see more realistic conditions where visitors get to understand nature's cycles of life and death. But is that likely to happen? To protect the sensibility of the public, most zoos give their predators anonymous meat with no head or fur and chopped up into small pieces. Yeah, 
Silja Herberg is available to talk to visitors who are present on days when culled animals are fed to predators. Hold. How long have they been dead? Since about quarter of nine this morning. They're from our petting zoo. And until today, they've had a really lovely life there. She knows where our sausages come from. And that's what lions eat. It's part of nature, right? But not everyone can cope. Charlene Avaduto and her godson Noah made a quick exit from the lion's feeding time. You seemed pretty affected by what you saw. You were shocked, right? Yeah. Noah was pretty scared, right? It's a bit frightening to see whole animals being fed to others. And you see the blood, too. Lions need to eat meat, meaning animals. Normally, we feed our carnivores meat we get from a slaughterhouse, just like you get your steak from a butcher. Since there's no connection to the animal, it doesn't upset you. But this does upset us. It upsets us, too. But we feel we need to show a part of the cycle of nature. Yeah. That's nature. It's horrible, but we enjoy the taste of it. And the lions do, too. <laughs> We're willing to risk upsetting a visitor or two because it's important. Most people learn from what they've seen and accept it as part of nature. It would be unnatural to keep it hidden. Which animals are culled in zoos and why? Over the years, zoos have learned how to provide optimal care for animals in captivity. And more and more animals born in captivity are surviving and reaching a ripe old age. That means that zoos are running out of space. Further south in Germany, the daily routine in Nuremberg Zoo's gorilla sanctuary begins with a contraceptive breakfast. It's the regular pill for women. We insert it into a chunk of banana and the ape eats it. Mm. Zookeeper Ramona Such administers the pill in the morning before the gorillas head outside to their enclosure, at the same time every day. Come here, Habibu. Not you. 21 days on the pill, followed by a week without, just like with humans. Good. Catalino, you'll both be going out in a second. Nurmag has welcomed the birth of two baby gorillas in the last three years. The male gorilla, Thomas, has now passed on his genes to enough offspring. That's why the contraceptives have been introduced. These days, a primate born in captivity is no longer headline news. Most young animals used to be caught in the wild. Zoo births were so rare that only humans were entrusted with caring for them. This was well intended, but had unintended side effects. Young animals reared by humans often lost many of their natural parental instincts. Nuremberg Zoo director Dag Enke remembers the old days. As a boy in the 1970s, he enjoyed being a playmate for the young apes in the Krefeld Zoo, where his father was the director. Today, Doug Enke is also vice president of the German Zoo Association. He's worried about how animals like his two infant male gorillas will be faring in 15 or 20 years. Each group of females needs only one mature male for breeding, so these infant males aren't needed for the breeding program. Das sind für uns auch these are issues that can be emotionally overwhelming for people who work with the animals. None of us would be able to just say, fine, we'll put him down tomorrow. So we have to arrive at a solution that we're able to tolerate and live with. 
so machen, dass wir sie auch durchhalten können. Releasing them into the wild is currently not an option. A shrinking natural habitat means that gorillas are at risk of extinction. Taking it to the extreme, you could say, we're going to stop breeding them because the growing number of old animals pushes the population pyramid up. It becomes leaf-shaped and eventually you have zero at the stem, meaning no new offspring. So the species is effectively extinct long before the last animal has died. It's illusory to just say, we have so many animals here. If they're unable to reproduce, then the species is dead. Doug Enke sees his zoo as a kind of sacred ark, preserving species that are dying out in the wild. But an ark has a limited number of animals on board, and it can only stay afloat if it produces future generations. Arani is one of only 35 female Asian lions still registered as potential breeding stock in European zoos. She tends to hide away when we arrive. <laughs> Once she sees the vet. <laughs> of course. Arani! <laughs> She's watching us. Arani! <laughs> Until August 2021, the lion's compound also included a male called Subali. When he grew older and became sterile, the director raised the possibility of having him put down and replaced with another male. Subali was one of the zoo's biggest attractions, however, and the idea of him being killed provoked a backlash from both the public and the media. Mit großen, traurigen Löwenaugen schaut Subali drein. Subali hat ein Problem. Mit dem Nachwuchs klappt es nicht so richtig. Im schlimmsten Fall muss das Tier getötet werden. Arani is now alone. Subali has been euthanized because he was sick and in pain, says Doug Enke. It's a prime example of the dilemmas you can face with conservation measures involving a highly endangered species. We have the job of preserving and nurturing a healthy population, which means looking extremely closely at using the potential. If there are only 35 fertile female lions available and one of them is paired with an infertile male, then we have to vacate that spot. So we were really happy that he died. Really? Yes. In the kind of zoo that Doug Enke would like to see, the lifespan of an individual animal comes second to the survival of a species. German animal welfare laws have strict standards for culling a healthy animal. Killing an animal in order to eat it meets that standard, and so does killing one zoo animal to feed it to others. An animal no longer meeting the needs of a breeding program does not meet the legal standard for culling. Germany's Association of Zoo Operators is advocating for those laws to be changed. There are a lot of situations today where there's no good solution for us, for our conscience. We need solutions that make sense in the long term, even if they can sometimes cause us a lot of pain. So visitors will also have to stomach that? Everyone will. Or we have fewer species. There is one country where the setup envisaged by Doug Enke is already a reality. Denmark. In 2014, Copenhagen Zoo euthanized Marius the giraffe because his genes were already well represented in breeding programs. No zoo had a herd that could accommodate him. Veterinarian Mats Bertelsen had been present at Marius's birth and was now the man who pulled the trigger when he was two years old. Bertelsen also publicly dissected the animal in front of visitors. Eight years on, people still regularly ask him about Marius. So this is our commissary where we prepare the food for the animals and, and actually Marius was dissected right here and, um, and then later on fed to our lines. Looks a little bit different today in the sunlight. This kind of public anatomy class is not unusual in Denmark. Well, the people who came to watch here, first of all, paid the entrance fee and then secondly decided to go behind the scenes to watch this. So nobody were inadvertently uh, subjected to this. They chose to be here and, and there were a lot of children here. And in fact, the children were the ones asking the best questions. 
Mats Bertelsen is now the zoo's director. The zoo now has two new giraffe calves, Marius's half-sister and a young bull. It's unclear whether the young bull will be needed in the breeding program, the same situation that Marius found himself in. There's a constant dynamic, so, so you never know right from the beginning. Um, but after a while, it became, it became clear, and, and at, at the time that he, he was eventually shot, it was because he was now fighting with his father, just like we're seeing the rhinos behind me here, and it's time to move then. With many species, there's only room for one mature male in a group. This young rhino will soon be moved to another zoo, where he'll be given his own herd. That option wasn't available for Marius, so he was culled and fed to the zoo's lions. A few months later, the lions were also euthanized. What might sound like poor planning is actually part of a strategy. The lions in Copenhagen live in a pride, together with their young. Many zoos in Germany also use contraceptives to limit the number of surplus animals. But there are potential side effects, including uterine tumors and permanent infertility. The lions here only produce offspring every two or three years, just like in nature. And that's only possible because animals are culled. I think that basically quality of life is more important than quantity of life. And an animal doesn't plan ahead. A lion doesn't know how long its life is going to be, but it does know how the life feels. And I think a lion pride is much more functional and much more natural if they have youngsters. These young lions are scheduled for transfer to another zoo. But around half of the males born here end up being put down when they're about two, the age at which in the wild they would be expelled from their pride. That context is something the Copenhagen Zoo explains to its visitors. I don't think Danes are any, any uh, harder or tougher than, uh, than Germans, and I think there are more hunters in Germany uh, uh, percentage-wise. So, no, I think this is, this is a PR uh, question. This is just something, and of course the legislation it, it comes into it, but, but this is something that we need to consider very carefully why do we need, what do we need to do, and then, and then do what is right. But who decides what is right? Zoos culling worms, insects and mice? What about animals that humans eat too? Or other similar animals? What about animals that would be shot by hunters when humans destroy their natural habitat? What guidelines should we follow? And why? It's a debate that is welcomed here in Wuppertal. The zoo's director, Zilja Herbeck, is looking for the female zebra that has been attacked and driven out of the herd by the male and needs a new home. Another zoo has now said it might take Charlotte. But right now it's too hot to transfer her. We'll have to find an alternative solution, driving overnight. It would be great for her to find a group where she'll be okay. That's the idea. Zoos sometimes exchange animals in situations like this, or to prevent inbreeding. Finding a taker for a female tends to be easier than with males. I'm going in. Elephant cow Tika is pregnant. Yeah, so it's good. Veterinarian Saskia Dreyer is performing an ultrasound. But they will only find out the elephant baby's sex when it's born. No, maybe here instead. A female would be good news for the breeding registry. The number of elephants born in zoos isn't high enough to preserve the species. Looks good. But the number of bulls is already close to the maximum. I'm looking at the head and the trunk. The breeding registry provides zoo director Anna Lavrens with a running record of all 190 African elephants kept in zoos across Europe. The gender balance among the older zoo elephants is similar to what's seen in nature. The females far outnumber the males. That's because many were born in the wild, 
at a time when Zhu seized the chance to acquire females while that was still permitted. Among elephants born in captivity, however, the gender balance is now equal, and that's a problem. That's because in the wild, elephants live in matriarchal herds in which the females spend their entire lives together. Males eventually leave their group. Many of them die at a young age. Tika had her last offspring, a girl, two years ago. The entire herd supported her during the birth. Elephants have strong family bonds and are extremely social animals. They enjoy playing with the young calves in the herd. A complete halt to breeding programs in order to prevent excess males could destroy their social structures. So the zoos are looking for compromise solutions. One idea is to extend the intervals between births, but ultimately we're just extending the process where we at some point have to take action. Elephants live to the age of 40, 50 or 60 years old. In recent years, zoos have been establishing groups of young elephant bulls to take in surplus males. Those areas of Africa where elephants can still live in safety from poachers have no room for additional males. It's only a matter of time until zoos run out of capacity. And what happens then? Nuremberg Zoo director Doug Enke is looking for a solution for his two infant gorillas, which are now registered as surplus animals. That quest has brought him to the Dutch city of Kerkrade. Along with the silverbacks and females in Gaia Zoo, there are two gorillas that wouldn't exist in the wild, castrated males. This is from there. It is pretty bizarre, seeing them grow to the size of a regular male while staying extremely thin. And that's not feminine either, because adult females actually get rather fat. So this is a quite unique phenotype. The males were castrated so that their father wouldn't attack them, and they could remain in the group. Doug Enke is meeting with Patrick van Veen. The biologist is a senior advisor to the wildlife conservation group set up by pioneering primatologist Jane Goodall. The zoo's breeding director, Emil Prinz, also joins him. He and his team have been conducting an experiment. They're integrating a new silverback into the group of castrated adult males. That was our biggest worry, him. He was our biggest worry with the introduction of the new silverback, um, because we were afraid, because they're the same age and maybe he is competition. It was nothing else than a female, really, for the silverback, I would say. The new silverback doesn't see the castrated males as rivals. The procedure was carried out before they'd reached puberty, which explains their abnormal development. Looks like Kermit. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah. To provide a healthy social group for surplus males, other zoos are likely to begin castrating young gorillas. In a perfect world, Patrick van Veen would prefer that no primates live in captivity. But the prospects for apes in the wild aren't rosy either. The problem is that it's in the problem is that there will be no gorillas left in 40 or 50 years' time. They do still exist, but in populations that are no longer sustainable. It looks like the reserve populations in zoos, which still have a healthy balance, will be crucial for any attempts to preserve apes in the wild. Zoos really do have a responsibility to plan ahead for what to do with the animals in the future. Artificial mortality is an absolute no-go. That's something I would never support. I'm afraid we'll reach the point where we have to say, do our ethical standards apply to the species or the individual animal? And how do we reconcile that with reality? Unlike this silverback, the young gorilla males in Nuremberg will never head a group of females. But castrating them means they will be able to grow old in the group they were born into. Of course, it's a compromise approach. 
and our overall conservation concepts will have to incorporate a lot of compromises with natural conditions. Zoos have spent years trying to provide animals in captivity with a more natural environment. Now, so many species have become fertile enough that zoos have to use castration or contraception. Or they have to take a previously unthinkable step, making sure that the mortality rate in zoos is similar to the wild. Over in Wuppertal, the ostracized female zebra will be spared the fate of being fed to the lions. Charlotte is going to be picked up today. The plan is to usher her into the trailer box as soon as the connecting door opens. We make our exit and leave her alone. So you go into the box. If need be. Won't happen. It'd be the absolute worst case scenario. And remember, she might come back at you with a real thump, so put your whole body behind it. Promise. And then it's time. See anything? Yeah. Celia Herbeck's job is to shut the door as soon as the zebra is inside the trailer. Charlotte has a six-hour drive ahead of her to her new home in Bavaria. In this case, it's a nicer outcome than feeding her to other animals, because I know she's still got most of her life ahead of her. She'll have offspring and will be able to raise her own young. That wasn't possible here because she's still young and the stallion threw her out of the herd. And before that, she hadn't reached full sexual maturity. So that life is now beginning for her, which is great. Zilia Herberg wants to give her animals a happy life in captivity, in the company of their own kind. That's why she and Anne Lavren see culling healthy individuals as a price worth paying, even though it's painful, especially when it comes to certain species. Maybe I'm just hoping that I'll be retired before it comes to that. But sadly, I know, I believe that it's the only option for sustainably managing endangered and small populations. It will allow us to ensure reproduction and other animal welfare priorities. That's why it's important for us to talk about it and for people to give some thought to the issue. For many visitors, zoos have been an idealized world, a place of refuge. How will they respond if zoo operators are forced to confront harsh realities with painful solutions?